Welcome to the Friends of Oak, of the Oak Park Conservatory's virtual lecture on bulbs. I'm Ellen Kuhner. I'm a member of the board and I'm tonight's moderator. I love bulbs from the six foot lilies that bloom with huge candelabras to the tiny early um, anemone blonda. Oh, the wonders of bulbs. When the first snowdrops appear above the snow, spring is here. Crocuses poke their spiky leaves above the ground and then bloodroot blooms. And if you're lucky, perhaps a few um, miniature fritillaria will appear. A bit later, the whole, some whole lawns are covered with gorgeous blue scylla. Um, the best public place in, to view this in Oak Park is the front lawn of the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio at Forest and Chicago Avenue. All of this makes me think of freshly grown spring lettuce, spinach, and radishes. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome Krista, Krista uh, Cooperschmidt. Um, she has a degree in greenhouse management from the College of DuPage. Um, has worked in a number of garden centers, including Frank's, remember that? Um, she joined the conservatory 12 years ago and now is the horticulture supervisor where she is responsible for care and maintenance of the landscaping within the village's parks and facilities. A huge um, position and a very busy person. Um, she will talk about how where and what to plant in a in, to plant uh, for beauty in the garden and what bulbs to plant for continuing beauty throughout summer and fall. And yes, there really are fall crocuses. Um, Krista and I will answer questions we following her presentation. Note that there's a little thing on the bottom of your screen that says chat. Type your question in there. Nancy Silver will be monitoring those. So here's Krista. Thank you, Ellen. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy and Judy for having me tonight. Um, as Ellen said, I work at the Oak Park Conservatory, which is part of the Park District of Oak Park. I'm the horticulture supervisor here. Um, and we do a lot of bulb planting. Um, it is one of my favorite subjects. Um, there is something about if you're a, a gardener um, going to the garden centers at this time of year, um, you know that the bulbs are always in these beautiful boxes. They're lined up with gorgeous pictures on the front. Um, and it kind of makes me remember being a kid in a toy store and seeing all the same thing, all the colors, the textures. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful time of year to get some inspiration for the spring. Um, I just want to make sure, can everybody see my slide? Yes, okay, great. Um, so since this is Bulb Planting 101, I thought we would start out discussing um, some of the commonly planted bulbs that are out there, um, what they like, where they should be planted, um, the varieties within those bulbs that you can find. Um, after that, talking about some more maybe specialty bulbs that you won't find in as many places. Um, and after that, some more plants that are not bulbs, but I think they fit well into this talk um, because you often find them now alongside bulbs uh, to be planted now and enjoyed in spring. And then finally, we'll go over bulb selection, when you're at the store buying them, what you should be looking for, um, planting, tools, how to plant, what kind of holes to dig, how to keep squirrels away, all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna start out here, and on the main screen here, you can see these tulips are, um, that was the picture from Scoville Park in mid-April of this year. And that is a Van Eyck tulip, which is a Darwin series tulip, which we'll, I will talk about more when we get to tulips, um, but really pretty. Um, I noticed around here, for some reason, tulips are the bulbs that everybody notices. Um, we get more comments on tulips than daffodils or any other bulb. Maybe it's the the um, vast array of colors, I'm not sure what it is, but it's definitely a well-loved bulb. 
Let's see. I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Okay, there we go. So within tulips, there's many different varieties. Um, it's nice because there are mid, early, late blooming varieties. Um, you can do a succession planting and have tulips blooming for a, a long part of the season. Um, like I said, there's many colors they come in. Tulips originated in the Middle East. Um, I think a lot of people um, have this conception that because you often see uh, pictures of the fields of tulips in, in the Netherlands um, or Amsterdam or Holland, that that's where they're from, but that's not where they're from. They're just grown there nowadays um, for sale. Um, but they're from the Mideast, Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Iran, that area originally. And a lot of those original tulips um, look something like this bottom one here, Tulipa tarda, or this up here, Tulipa clusiana, um, where to me they definitely look more wild. Um, often they're shorter, much shorter than your kind of classic um, two foot tall, very large flower, more like maybe this one here or this here that we would see nowadays planted. Um, but what's great about those species tulips, these smaller ones, is that they're wonderful perennials. And typically tulips that we purchase um, that give us that big show of color that we use in the parks um, with a very large flower head um, are not good perennials. Um, often a year or two is what you will get out of them um, and you just kind of accept that um, and plant them yearly or every other year. So when I talk about naturalizing types of tulips um, or, or any bulb for that matter, naturalizing basically means a, a good perennial. It's spreading underground. It's making more of itself. Um, it doesn't take any special care um, versus some of the showy, very large tulips that are commonly planted like along say um, Michigan Avenue or in some of our parks. A lot of times those um, are more of an annual. So you would expect to get a year, maybe two, like we take ours out when we're done so we can put annuals in. Um, they do appreciate full sun and most bulbs want good drainage, depend, you know, regardless of the bulb. Um, and I know that's kind of a tricky, what, what does good drainage mean? Um, if you have a spot in your yard maybe that you notice after a rain holds a lot of water, that would not be an area to plant bulbs. Um, it is true that tulips are a favorite of squirrels. I don't know what it is about the tulips. They do love them. Um, we have noticed over the years, um, just trying some different things that you can plant them a little more deeply than typically suggested. And that helps a bit with the tulips um, not being dug up by the squirrels. There is also some people use chicken wire on top um, to kind of uh, foil the, the squirrels. Or you could also, it's that newly churned up earth that they're looking for. They notice that something went in there and they can easily get in. So they're gonna take full advantage. Um, so maybe if you stuck like a patio stone or something like that over where you've planted for maybe a week just to kind of deter them and also to tamp down the soil, that's also another option. Um, over here in the corner here, this Tulipa kaufmanniana, that's also another species tulip that is not um, one of those big flashy tulips. I still think it's flashy, but it's not those big heads. It's maybe about eight inches a foot tall. Those are in my yard and I bought those 11 years ago. I think I probably bought 15 bulbs at the time. And I recognized, uh, this was at a big box store, I'll admit to that. And um, I recognized that that was a tulip that could be a good perennial. So I planted that and it's done really, really well for me and it has multiplied over the years. So it's definitely possible to have um, tulips in your yard that last for a long time. It's true, you're just giving up some of those really, really big flowers. Um, not that I can blame people at all though for, for planting those um, especially like a parrot tulip that has just all those petals and opens up like a rose. It's really, really beautiful. So there's lots of, lots of options. Daffodils are another commonly planted bulb. 
I really appreciate them because they're just easy. Um, they're not bothered by um, squirrels or any other uh, rodents out there. Um, typically you plant them, they will spread over time. Some are better spreaders than others. Um, if you notice over the years that your flowering has decreased, it could very well be because they've spread well and they need to be dug up, divided, and some move to other locations so that they can, you know, continue growing. Um, but I feel like if you're a beginner, daffodils are a great one to start with because you will have good luck and it always definitely helps to um, have a positive experience the first time. There's, again, many, many types of daffodils. Um, double would be something like this here where a double usually means it just has many more petals. Um, so it doesn't quite look like your average daffodil. Um, some of them are quite fragrant. This is a very old variety um, that's been around hundreds of years and is quite fragrant. Then you have the little tiny blooming um, daffodils that I feel like you also find in say grocery stores in the spring. Um, those are nice, really cheery. You can have them in the house and then when they're done, you can go ahead and take that pot outside and you can plant those in your yard. A lot of plants that won't work with, but daffodils, that, that'll work. It'll come back for you. And then there's jonquilla, which are um, daffodils that have many flowers on one stem. Um, the more flowers, the better, I feel. So that's, that's a great one. Or large cup varieties would be something like a Mount Hood that's just a very large flower head. Um, when you walk past those, you definitely notice them. They're beautiful. Um, and again, all of these very good perennials um, don't take any special treatment, are pretty tolerant of different soils. Um, it's a good one to start with. Moving on to alliums um, or now onions. So these will definitely smell like an onion when you take it out of the bag or when you're handling it. There are so many different types of alliums um, ranging from very short, kind of delicate looking, um, white, yellow, pink, blooming, blue, um, to those that are tall. I, I feel like you do see Allium Globemaster um, around here in the late spring, um, where they just it just has that very upright, narrow stem and then that gigantic flower um, on the top of it. Those are wonderful. Um, they're not great spreaders. That's the kind of thing you buy one bulb, you're getting one plant, one big flower. Um, so a lot of times people will buy quite a few of them to have, uh, have a good show. The only time I wouldn't recommend some of these larger ones is if it's in a very exposed site or has a lot of wind because they will, because of how heavy they are on top, they will kind of lean or fall over. Um, you'll also notice that people with those larger alliums, after they finish blooming, they still look pretty. They still have a shape. And I'll see them just continuing to stand in people's gardens. Um, once in a while, driving through Oak Park, I'll see where somebody has sprayed theirs, maybe gold or silver. Um, and it, it kind of jumps out at you because you're like, what is that? But it's an interesting ornament in the garden. Um, and again, there's like Allium schimbertii here, very, I don't know, almost like a galaxy in the sky. Um, just really different looking, kind of bizarre, um, but a lot of fun. And these are blooming, I would say, it's probably more like late spring. Um, but these are great, very attractive to pollinators. We'll see, you know, native bees and other insects out there doing their thing when you think there's nothing out there for, for them to be interested in, but they're definitely finding these. And I also did include, just to show the relationship, um, this Allium Summer Beauty here in the corner. That's a very commonly planted now, very popular um, perennial. It is more of a bulbous root, I guess you would say, as opposed to a, a pure bulb, um, but it's, it's sold in all the garden centers, we have a lot of it in the parks. 
because it's such a good plant. It's tough, doesn't need any water. Again, a great pollinator. Um, once it gets to a certain size, go ahead, dig it up, split it, make more of it, give it to your friends. Um, just a really great plant. And they're starting to come out with more and more varieties of this one. Um, Summer Beauty, Millennium, I believe is the one that's in Millennium Park, and there's others, but really good plants. Um, the only thing I would say with that, uh, like I put here, is that um, they appreciate the more dry soil, definitely don't want to be um, in wet or they will rot. I've planted years ago, I, I know I planted quite a few of them, and at the time I wasn't thinking that the area was um, holding moisture, but when none of them come back, that's pretty much a key that it's, it's wetter than you think it is. Um, and again, I, I put here no yellowing leaves to contend with because for most of them, there's not much. Um, every bulb has its, uh, after it's finished blooming, you know, it's slowly kind of going to sleep and they will turn yellow, sometimes more slowly than you'd like before you can pull that away. Um, but these tend to be, I feel like a little quicker and there's not as much foliage to contend with. So that's nice. Let's see what's next here. Hyacinth. So these, if you've ever smelled one of these, um, you know why people plant them. They are just um, <clears throat> wonderfully perfumed, highly fragrant. Uh, they're sold a lot in the stores, I think, as a blooming plant in spring because they're wonderful to bring inside and have that fragrance. I don't have many in my yard, but the ones I do have, I tend to cut and bring in the house just because at that time of the year, you're not necessarily outside really appreciating that. Um, and they're, you know, low down to the ground, so you don't always smell them. I would say if you're going to plant them, plant quite a few so you have a good show um, and so that you can really enjoy the smell. They are a very upright grower. Um, and the top of them, the flower head again, can be quite heavy. So they could be maybe about a foot tall. Um, and ideally they would get sun from all directions because let's say you had these planted against um, the back of your house and it is only getting sun from one direction. They're gonna grow towards the sun and be more prone to flopping over and being laying on your, on your ground, which obviously you don't want those beautiful flowers on the ground. So it does help to have sun coming from all angles. Um, Yes, and I noticed, um, you know, it's funny with plants, we tend to think they're never going to, or I guess I do, they're never gonna cause us any irritation or bother our skin or I can touch anything. Um, and I found that these really break my arms out. Um, originally, I thought that was because I know some bulbs are dipped in a fungicide before going to stores as a way to help preserve the bulb. Um, but after looking into it more, I found that hyacinths, they are just a bulb that bothers some people and, call it, and cause a dermatitis on their skin. So it's just something to, to think about whenever you're really handling bulbs or plants you're not familiar with to uh, take care, maybe wear gloves, wash your hands afterwards, that kind of thing, just to make sure um, that you don't end up with any, any skin irritation. Grape hyacinths, <laughs> they're like a mini hyacinth. Uh, really pretty, delicate, wonderful planted in mass, like that bottom picture. Now, that's a lot of bulbs, <laughs> but um, that's really when they're striking. When you have small little flowers like that, when you plant a lot of them, um, it's breathtaking. Um, we just redid uh, the planting bed at Lake Street um, at Scoville on the, on the south end and we put in a large what we call a river of grape hyacinths uh, just a place kind of in the center of the bed that is just jam-packed full of them um, it has some curve to the bed and when they bloomed this spring they were really really outstanding so if you can use them in an area where you have plenty of room like that. Yeah, they're just, they're breathtaking. Um, they do pair well with tulips and daffodils, often kind of, you know, blooming at the same time. Um, they, they throw people off and people will ask about them because right now 
they are sending up leaves. And that's just what they do. They send up leaves in the fall. Over the winter, those leaves will die and come back again in the spring. Uh, but for what, whatever reason with this plant, it likes to send up its leaves in fall. Just to let you know that it's still there, underground, just waiting. Um, but yeah, that, that's a really nice, nice plant. And that you can get a few different varieties. Most look like that corner picture where they're just all purple, but some like this uh, peppermint have white tips. But yeah, there's all kinds of choices. That's what's nice about all the breeding that plant people have done. Um, you can get almost anything out there. So these are snowdrops. I don't know if Ellen mentioned these or not. She she may have. I don't, I'm not sure. I did. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice because this, as far as I know, and I've ever seen, is the very first sign of life in the garden in, in I would say, late winter, early spring. Um, they're often popping up through the snow. And there's nothing like seeing that on a winter day when you're kind of finished with winter knowing that it's right around the corner. Um, it just, it makes you feel good. <laughs> now these are small plants, so they're only maybe, I don't know, five inches tall or so. Um, again, so plant them in large groups so that they have an effect um, and plant them where you're going to see them, where you're gonna notice them. If that is on the sides of your walk on the way to your garage, then I suggest that's where you plant them somewhere definitely where you're going to notice them, not to the back um, where you're not going to be seeing them every day. They're great at spreading over time. They appreciate our very cold winters. Um, and yeah, they're just, they're beautiful. And it is, it's something about seeing that first, those first snowdrops. Um, it's nice to know that spring is right around the corner and everything else is just going to start blooming soon. Yeah. They're a great little plant and very easy, very easy. Crocus. Um, I don't feel like crocus are planted enough. Um, they are an, another early bloomer. Many of these bulbs, as I was, uh, you know, making this presentation, I realized, man, there are a lot of pretty short um, bulbs that are great in mass. This is another one. Um, because when it's just a few bulbs, you're just not gonna notice it, the more the better. Um, what I think is interesting, uh, and I don't think it's probably planted much around here, although it is hardy enough to be, is Crocus sedivus is where saffron comes from. That is the stigma you can see <clears throat> with those pink tweezers down here are taking from the flower, and that's where your saffron comes from for cooking. Um, I think it takes some crazy amount <laughs> of um, stigmas to make up a little jar of um, spice. So that's, I think, part of the reason it's so expensive. But it's always nice to see the connection in plants to things we use in our everyday life. Not that we all use saffron every day, but you know, things we eat and um, use. Um, the swirls can like these. This would be another one that I think after you plant, you might want to set something on top of there for a while to make sure they're not getting in the soil and getting to them. Um, and another one that would prefer a drier soil. I, I feel like a lot of us around here have clay soil. If that is what you're dealing with, I would just stay shy of these and try something else because there's, there's plenty to choose from, but this one um, would uh, appreciate a more well-drained soil. Yeah, really pretty plant though. And again, it comes in that bright golden yellow, purples, kind of multicolored, pale purples. Um, as Ellen mentioned, and will be further on in the slideshow, there is an autumn crocus, which you buy now and is usually blooming when you buy it, um, which is kind of strange, um, but it's, it's blooming now. Um, yeah, well, we'll get to that one uh, uh, coming ahead. English bluebells. So these are hyacinthoides, and they truly, to me, um, look like an informal version of a hyacinth. So it's less little florets on the flower tops, but very pretty. Um, I just think like English countryside, which I think is, is where you're going to find a lot of these. I, I believe um, Southwest, yeah, Southwest Europe is, is 
where you'll see these a lot in the woods. Um, a May, April bloom. It can tolerate some shady conditions um, under trees. Um, it does go dormant in the summer. Um, and it is especially nice, I think, in how they have it in the bottom picture where you can incorporate that <clears throat> excuse me, with either hostas that are emerging, which is what that picture is in spring, or ferns, or for that matter, any other plant that is kind of coming up with foliage then, because as those bluebells stop blooming and slowly kind of die away, turn yellow, you're not going to notice that nearly as much because you're going to have all that foliage from the hostas or whatever kind of covering that up. Um, so yeah, those work really well together. And that's something I feel like too, you just kind of learn over time. Um, and, and if you have a garden, seeing things happen, oh, that's why I did that. Um, but yeah, that, that works really well. That's a really pretty plant. Siberian squill. Okay, so Ellen mentioned that the best example of this is at the Frank Lloyd Wright house. <laughs> And okay, then the second best example, <laughs> I think, is at Cheney Mansion, um, which is a park district um, facility. And there is a lot of this towards the back of the estate, kind of by the pond. It is just, it's so pretty in the spring. Again, this is another one that I think you should plant quite a bit at a time, but it will also help you out and multiply. Um, a lot of Oak Parkers have this um, in their lawns and some of the older houses um, and people will ask us, what is that blue tiny flower that's all over the lawns? We get asked that every year and we say that Siberian squill or Scylla is its name. Um, and yeah, it's just a very easy one to kind of to make it look natural. You just take your bag, kind of scatter them, stand in the lawn, scatter them and, and plant them where they fall. Um, they do, I think, have a kind of rough period after they've finished blooming. Um, and then they slowly, you know, the leaves slowly turn yellow until they've finally died away. Um, and I know some people have a tough time with that because you do have to kind of put up with the a kind of messy look for a little bit. I think it's completely worth it. Um, and then at some point when, you know, the yellow is, is there, you can go ahead, like if this is in your lawn, mow, and then that's basically gone and you'll see it again next spring then. But yeah, really, really pretty mid uh, spring bloomer and typically not a problem with, um, with animals for these either. Um, but I would plant quite a few at a time because uh, you can't really tell in the pictures how small they are, but again, maybe four inches off the ground. I mean, they're, they're just not very big plants, um, but really, really pretty. Oh, and lilies. Okay. Um, lilies are a later bloomer. So this is something where you're moving into midsummer, late summer, fall. Um, I feel like there is a lily for everybody. Um, they, you can get lilies, um, something like an Asiatic up here, this pink that is only maybe a foot, foot and a half tall. And then you can have um, very fragrant lilies like this uh, stargazer. I just put it in because it's, that's the cut flower you see in a lot of um, stores because it really smells great. Um, then there are some species uh, tulips, so these are more like what you would find um, naturally growing. I believe Mardigan here, the pink, is from Europe, and then this Turk's cap, which is an orange, is, is from the, the U.S. And they have the recurved petals that kind of pull back, um, and those are very tall. Um, you can get lilies up to probably eight feet tall, although I feel like I've seen them easily reach seven feet around here. Mm -hmm. Um, they do prefer uh, sunny, sunny tops, shady bottoms, they say. Um, so the, the top of them is getting a lot of sun, allowing all those buds to open up. Um, and then down below near the ground, they're kept well shaded so the roots are, are cooler. Um, I think the tall ones are great and totally underused. 
Um, they just fit very nicely in between plants um, because they're such vertical growers. Um, you can stick a, a clump of three of them in between, say, an aster and, oh Lord, I wasn't prepared, a, a heliopsis or something else, and they will just grow straight up through them, um, not taking up a lot of room, <clears throat> bloom beautifully, um, and then when they're done with their blooms, the petals fall off and you're just left with a green stem. So nothing, um, just it blends in really well. Um, I would, like I put here in the slide, I, I would plant at least three at a time, um, kind of together in a hole so you have a good show. I think a lot of times a mistake that people make is planting one bulb here, one bulb there, um, and why any bulb, any bulb is appreciated and loved when it comes up, but it definitely helps to have a little clump, a rule of three, where you get more of a show. Um, and these can be the planted in bulbs commonly, or even, you know, if you are a garden center lover, as myself, you will see these sold in gallon containers in, uh, in a perennial area within a garden center, um, usually at, at about bloom time. I think they don't do it much because obviously it's a hard thing to transport, being tall and delicate. Um, but when you see them, um, I, I'm sure they sell out because they're just, they're, they're pretty breathtaking, very pretty. So, um, and, and like I said, many different types of lilies. Longiflorum are, the heads are long, I wonder if, it, I'm not positive, I think an, an Easter lily may be a Longiflorum where it's a very long, um, stretched out kind of, flower head, um, trumpets, oriental species, like I said, have the recurved petals, a totally different look where they kind of um, bend back, but just lots of options, lots of options. And with the tall ones, um, it's good to keep in mind that you may have to stake them. I'm not a fan of staking things, but when they're that tall, if they're not sighted exactly in the right place, um, or if it's a little windy, they may, um, they require staking, or it's great to have them kind of in between some taller plants so that way they can kind of lean on one another. But lots of, lots of options with the lilies. Okay, so bearded iris. Again, this isn't a bulb, but it is a commonly planted fall um, root or rhizome that is often found beside the bulbs in the stores. So if you're if you're at a garden center or back, a big box store, these will often be, you know, with those plants, with the bulbs. Um, I was always intimidated by these for some reason. There's something about the look of what you're buying is usually this right here. And it just doesn't look promising to me. <laughs> but they're remarkably easy um, to grow. So this, let's see here. This is the rhizome. A rhizome is just a different root structure that grows horizontally across the soil. And this barely has to be covered with soil. So you're basically scratching at the surface of your soil, putting this in, kind of letting the, the roots that are there um, spread out. <clears throat> I remember thinking that, oh, this isn't, there's no way it'll be here the next day because it's, it's barely covered, like with a half inch of soil, somebody's gonna knock it over or, but it was still there. Um, and if you needed to, you could always use something like a garden staple, which basically looks like a large staple from a stapler um, to kind of secure it into the ground. Um, but they get going pretty quickly and will form a nice clump over time. This is what kind of an established clump would look like. You can see it's traveling vertically, uh, horizontally, I'm sorry, across the soil, really is growing on the surface of the soil. Um, making more of itself. The, the blooms are beautiful. There's many on one stem. It's a little later spring bloomer. Um, definitely a lot of sun, good drainage, and you can see, kind of understand why with these rhizomes sitting right on the surface, if those were to be covered in any kind of water or mulch, for that matter, um, could easily rot away. So definitely steer clear of of, of mulch around these. Um, every few, maybe even like five years, 
<clears throat> it wouldn't hurt to divide that. You can see over time, it kind of will get um, hollowed out here in the center it, and flowering may decrease again. And that's just a sign that you need to chop up that plant, uh, move it around in your yard, give it to your friends or neighbors. Um, and again, just an, an easy one to, to grow. They usually smell, often these newer cultivars are rebloomers. I was surprised the first year I got them that I got that late spring bloom. And then it was maybe late summer, early fall, I got another set of blooms. I was not expecting that, um, but that's always nice. Um, but like I said, yeah, these are commonly found right about now into fall alongside the bulbs, an, an easy plant, not very attractive as you're buying it, of course, but it will, it'll, um, it'll do well for you. All right, and then some other um, not as commonly planted bulbs I thought would be good uh, to, to highlight too. And there's so many, there's so many bulbs out there, so many opportunities um, to, to find something that really speaks to you. Um, Ellen had mentioned Fritillaria, which there are many different species of. This is, I believe it's called checkered lily commonly, one of the names maybe. Mm, I think so. Very, yes, very pretty. Um, I don't know how to describe it, dainty, these little, they kind of hang over, just very pretty, kind of reminds me of a heliobore for some reason. Um, but just a beautiful plant that Definitely, you do, do not see very often. Um, these do enjoy consistent moisture through the season, so sometimes um, that can be hard around here, um, but just something to keep in mind with them. This Aranthus uh, winter aconite, the yellow in the corner there, that's another very low to the ground, almost forms like a little ground cover. I know there's a house here, drive by it every every spring in Oak Park that has it planted on the side of their house and it's really pretty uh, when it's just in mass. There's just a lot of it, bright gold yellow, um, kind of a ferny leaf around it. Um, and it obviously spreads really well. Um, about a March, late March, April bloom, um, very pretty. Yeah, good at naturalizing, good at spreading. Iris hundalica or, or Dutch iris, those are, are basically what you see as a cut flower in the in the stores if you're buying irises um, as a cut flower. Um, full sun for these would be best. They're about two feet tall um, and available in those types of colors there. So whites, yellows, purples, different shades of purple. Um, really pretty. I don't feel like they last a really long time, the flowers themselves, but they're so, they're just so spectacular. It's nice to have them in the garden. And then the bottom there, the pink, the giant autumn crocus, that is colchicum, I believe it's, it's called. Um, and, and like I said earlier, that's a different kind of crocus that is usually blooming soon. Or maybe, no, I feel like it's soon. I know there's a couple in Austin Garden that pop up. And people are always like, what is that? Um, it's a pretty short bloom, I feel like. It, it happens pretty fast, um, but it's always a nice surprise. It's this pink, maybe um, four inches or so in the soil. It's a decent size bloom on it, um, but very pretty. Can handle, you know, full sun to part sh shade. And it, it is something you would, as soon as, as soon as you see it in the stores to, to buy it, buy it and plant it right away because sometimes it is already blooming in the store. I've noticed right in the bag it's blooming. And then here we have this pretty blue with the white center. Um, I don't see this planted that often either. Glory of the Snow or Cayenne Doxa. Um, another very early blooming, um, naturalized as well. Um, when I do see this, it jumps out at me because it has that white center to the blue. Um, so yeah, just another really pretty one, Glory of the Snow. And up top here we have Anemone blanda, or it's called, commonly called Grecian Windflower. Really pretty kind of ferny foliage around the very delicate daisy-like blooms. Um, I believe whites, purples, pinks, a blue is what you get. Um, they're not very tall at all. 
kind of makes a nice little ground cover. Um, an April bloom, I would say, full sun to part shade. And then after they're done, they, they pretty much disappear. I don't feel like the foliage sticks around after, after they're done, um, but they come back next year, next spring. And then one of my favorites on the bottom there, Camassia, um, I don't feel like that's planted that much either around here, but it does well. I've had it in my yard for many years. Um, it does well not disturbed. So once you plant it, just leave it there. Um, and I have read that they can be quite tall, well, quite tall, maybe three feet tall. Mine are definitely not that tall. I'm sure that's maybe a different variety. I would say it's about two feet tall, um, kind of just strappy foliage. It is a native to the Northwest United States here. Um, a late spring bloom, um, they can tolerate these a little more moisture some, than some of the other bulbs. But for me anyway, once it's done, it kind of, the, the green foliage kind of slowly dies back and then I don't even know it was there until next spring. So um, you just have to learn to kind of find what to plant with these things. So as they fade away, you have something else to, to replace them. Um, but really good bulbs, great choices. And then I wanted to bring up this, these are not bulbs, are they? No, I don't think so. I have to think about it harder, I guess. Um, but these are ephemerals. So ephemerals are plants with a very short um, life cycle. These come up and disappear within, I don't know, weeks maybe. Um, these are all native to the United States, so, you know, somewhere or, or other. Um, they come up quickly in spring, brighten things up, give a lot of joy, are very cheery. A lot of these you will see if you walk in Austin Gardens in the spring. <clears throat> I tend to think of them as like forest floor plants. So they're plants that really appreciate that later um, in summer being shaded, the soil is slightly moist, lots of leaf litter breaking down. Um, and yeah, very quick life cycle. So the trillium is that pretty like three petaled white um, over, and there's other colors as well, there's a maroon, uh, but just a very pretty plant, um, about a May bloom, and full to, full to part shade is fine for that. This is a very unique looking, um, Jack in the Pulpit is its common name, Erisema, I believe. Um, it enjoys a little more moist soil, about a May, April bloom, full to part um, shade, and this one after it's done, I feel like the leaf usually kind of ends up not looking too hot, but we'll have this incredible red berried seed head on it that you cannot miss. I mean, it's just, it's bright, it's blazing red with these berries on it um, that are just, it's setting seed. Um, but, and when people see that flower, they're like, what is that? It doesn't look like something that would grow around here. Um, Claytonia virginica, that's spring beauty. And this is another really tiny, um, flower, uh, also in Austin Gardens, pink, pink, white blooms, um, a quick bloomer, but really pretty. And people always comment on these, on these plants. Um, underneath here, uh, is Sanguinaria. That's bloodroot. That's a really interesting plant. Um, as that white flower is opening, the leaf around it is unfurling. Just a really pretty, um, interesting shape, I think, to the whole plant. Um, that is about a March, March to April bloom, just, you know, depends on our weather and everything. It can be tolerant of dry soil once it's um, established, so that, that never hurts, because I feel like we have such dry circumstances usually in the summers here. And then in the upper right corner, um, Mertensia, that is Virginia bluebells. Um, and this is another one that people always comment on because when it comes up, the flowers kind of go through a change from many little florets on one stem. They start out as pink buds, then they move to, I want to say it's purple, and then when it opens, it's more of a sky blue, just really, really pretty. Um, fold apart shade, 
And this is one, again, that after, you know, if you miss a couple weeks, it may be in your yard and it's just gone. It's not there anymore. Um, these are tough plants to sell in a garden center because if people don't buy them at the precise moment that they are blooming and looking their best, they're basically garbage, because, unfortunately, because then they're just a, 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 what looks like an empty pot of soil. Um, so they're hard to sell that way, and I think often you'll have to find these online. Um, Ellen, if you would know of anywhere else, to, I don't feel like I see a lot of these in the garden centers. No, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. And Krista, it's getting to be oh. 10 to 8. Do you I have? Think. It is, sure. Yeah. Okay, this is fun. Move, let's but... move it along. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this um, mm -hmm. is just a, a, a little chart here to help you get an idea of size of bulbs, how tall things get, early, mid, late blooming, um, how deeply you would plant, plant the bulbs. Um, as a rule of thumb, and this has always worked when, I, when I've um, done it myself, a bulb should be planted three times the height of the bulb. So let's say your tulip bulb is two inches tall times three is six, so you're planting it six inches into the ground. Um, and I, I feel like I've used that, um, that rule and that's always worked for me. When you're, plant, when you're buying bulbs, you're purchasing bulbs, they should feel firm to the touch. Often they're in a bag, sometimes they're sold loosely. They should feel firm. Um, Sometimes you'll come across, it, it never hurts to come across one in the box where you see that has dried out because then you can really tell, yeah, oh, that's no good. It'll be much lighter in weight um, and definitely kind of look more shriveled. So obviously stay away from those. Um, when you're looking at the bulb, you're thinking, what's up? What's down? I don't know how to plant this. Many times there's a, a bit of a point to the bulb and that would go up. Um, and if you looked at the base, you'll often see old roots or remnants of roots on the bottom and that's the key that that was that was the bottom of the bulb if you're not if you're unsure never hurts to google you know image of a tulip base or of the bulb that'll, that'll help you right away find which way it goes um and one important thing to keep in mind with with all these bulbs is to try your hardest i know sometimes it's tough but to let that foliage die back naturally without, you know, it, your plant has bloomed, it looked great, it's bloomed, it's done, and now it's looking pretty shabby, it's part green, it's part yellow, it's hanging over, you wanna get rid of that, you wanna cut it, wait until all the green is gone, because while it is still green, it is actively storing energy from the sun and, and helping grow roots to be a longer lived plant for you in the future. Um, I know that's a tough one, because I have a hard time with that one with tulips, but. It does help definitely to um, to keep the alive parts there. And then with planting, um, personally, I found over the years for me, it's just a shovel is the works the best for me. But everybody has what they prefer. Um, I would always suggest planting several bulbs of one type in an area. Don't just do the one here, the foot later, you'll plant one more, a foot later, one more. Um, it's just disappointing in the spring because it's so sparse. Plant them a little more closely. This chart here gives you a good idea of how many you could have in a square foot area of each bulb. You'll see different, slightly different charts, and I, I found this one was a good kind of um, kind of standard, I thought. Um, as far, you know, as what you plant with here in the corner, you know, they're using a spade, just digging into the ground, pushing the spade over and then dropping that bulb in. Here, when you're doing a lot in one area, you just want to dig it. Well, it doesn't look like that's what he's done, but I would just dig all of this area out first place all the bulbs in, and then add the soil um, on top. I, I feel like in the end, it, it ends up being quicker. So usually I don't do any less than this. If, if I'm planting a, a, a bag of tulips, this is the least amount that is gonna go in the hole because uh, I want a decent show. Um, and also digging a hole like that, it's not that bad. It's much easier than using this trowel up here and putting one in at a time. 
if you have really good soil, which I hope you do, <laughs> we all hope for really good soil. This is a bulb auger. It has a drill bit uh, that can go on your, your drill. Um, but again, this has to go through really nice soil. If it comes up against any rocks or any um, clay, it just stops. Um, we have a professional version of this <laughs> that is maybe three feet tall that we use to plant our bulbs. And that's great for when you're doing it like every year. If you are a bulb planter extraordinaire and this is something you do all the time or a landscaper, it's worth having. Um, or otherwise, you know, some people choose these. These are just bulb diggers. And this is the, you know, kind of the standing up version of this to help you take out the soil. You try what works for you and you see, you know, what works best, what you enjoy the most. Um, it's a lot of fun to buy all these bulbs. And then you realize you have a lot of work to do when you're at home. <laughs> and last, I just wanted to give you some, some resources or places to go to. Um, unfortunately, we we at the conservatory have a bulb sale going on now, but it was all pre-order and it's all sold out. Um, I think this year with how things have been going, um, you know, we as well as our personal lives um, are being maybe more careful with what we spend and we weren't sure how this would go here this year. It went really well. So um, yes, yeah, so we sold out of all our bulbs. Uh, people are continuing to pick up their orders. Um, but I would say, you know, try the local um, greenhouses. I know Good Earth, there's City Escape on the west side. Um, if you've never been to Gethsemane Garden Center on North Clark, oh. yeah, that's a good place. <laughs> um, and then some um, online, some, oh, I'm sorry, Ellen, go ahead. No, I was just coughing. So. Oh, sorry. Um, so online sources. So Brent and Becky <clears throat> Bulbs is a, is a great, um, place to look at bulbs. If nothing else, just request their catalog and have it sent to your home because it has a ton of information. Really great pictures. pictures. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful pictures. Um, I want to say they're out of Connecticut, but anyway, just yeah, Virginia. Really, yeah, good information, good pictures. McLaren Zimmerman, um, another one that's been around a long time. Their catalog is in black and white though, I believe, but quality bulbs. And then Ellen made me aware of the Sheepers, um, which they have a wonderful website with a lot available, um, a lot to look at. Uh, and I did notice, I've been to this one, one year I went to the Botanic Gardens Fall uh, Bulb Festival and that was a lot of fun. They have over 200 varieties of bulbs um, for sale um, from different vendors. It's a whole, you make a whole day of it. There's like, it's all fall related. There's apple cider. Now I'm sure this year you have to um, get a reservation probably and go, but that's a lot of fun. Um, even if you don't buy anything, just to walk around, look at everything, talk to vendors, find out more about them. Um, and there's my email on the bottom. Feel free if you have any questions or, or want to discuss more. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Well, thank you, Krista. Oh, no problem. My pleasure. Fun. Um, Nancy, do we have any questions? Oh, have to unmute yourself. Yes, that would that would help, wouldn't it? Um, thank you, Krista. That was so great, and I learned a lot, as I'm sure did everyone else. We um, we have lots of questions. Lots sure. Of questions. Um, so I'm going to toss this out to both you and Ellen, and you can kind of um, you know respond uh, where it seems good. Um, so first off, I know you touched on this a little bit, but um, there were some specific questions about how to deal with squirrels. Um, so in addition to kind of what you talked about, one question was, can you put in uh, chili flakes, red pepper flakes in the ground to deter squirrels? Is that something? Are there views? Right? Ellen, you want to go first and then I'll... I've heard of people doing that. I don't know if it works or not. Do you? Yeah, I feel the same way. I've heard of that. I, I've never tried it myself. I don't no. know. It's worth trying, I think, because um, it doesn't sound like it would be a very expensive <clears throat> um, way to go. Um, yeah, I don't know for sure if that works or not. Okay, and then if you're trying the chicken wire mm -hmm. um, over the bulbs approach, when should that be taken off? Oh, you would leave her. Just leave it and let the bulbs grow up mm -hmm. through it. Okay. 
Um, okay. Uh, a question about tulips. Do they need, do they all need full sun or can some tolerate some shade? Oh, a lot of bulbs can tolerate a lot of shade. Um, most of the in particular. small bulbs in the spring, because the trees haven't leafed out, are just delighted to be there and then they continue to grow. Um, some others, well, let's see. Um, the, the question was specifically about tulips. Can tulips tolerate some shade? Well, keep in mind with a lot of these bulbs that are coming up in spring, you may think you have shade, but at that time of year when they're, they're actually is probably not that much shade. Unless you live in an evergreen castle um, with all these pine trees around you, a lot of the trees don't leaf out until a little later, so you're probably getting more sun than you think. Um, are you willing to say that? And I would, I would try it anyway. Okay, good point. Um, how do you store daylilies indoors during the winter? You don't. <laughs> Because they're perennials and they last, they can tolerate frost and rain and snow and sleet and low temperatures, they're fine. But yeah, imagine, so just, that, imagine that you have to move, for example, and you want to take them with you. What do uh, you Oh. You um, can in a pot. In a pot. Mm -hmm. And just leave them with, I've heard of people who have you know, daylilies or hostas, certain plants, where they forgot yeah. to plant them and they just stuck them in the garage hoping for the best, you know, in a pot. And those are the types of plants, daylilies and hostas, that it's amazing the abuse and the cold temperatures they can take and still be alive in the spring. So I think it's worth trying, just put them in a pot and leave them in your garage and you, would, you may be surprised. <laughs> They're tough. Um, so this is a good question. You sort of touched on it, but um, one participant was asking about um, should you mulch over bulbs? I know you pointed out a couple that that wouldn't be a good idea, um, but just as a general rule of thumb, are there some that you would want to do that with? I think almost any except iris. Okay. Um, and a question about allium. Um, after they bloom, uh, anything you want to do with them? No, just, I mean, let that foliage die back naturally. If mm -hmm. it's one of the taller ones, that's your choice to leave it up if you like what's there for maybe winter interest. Um, if not, it'll be dry and you'll you'll feel that you can just um, give it a slight tug and it'll just come right out and then you just throw that in your, your yard waste. Um, okay. Um, there were, uh, before you go out to it, there are a bunch of questions about where to purchase bulbs in your park. So I think you covered that, but uh, another um, participant mentioned, wanted to give a shout out to um, Chalet in Wilmette. So oh, just sure. that oh, information because yeah. that's sure. another great yes. place. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. So mass planting, we talked a lot about mass planting. Um, but what does that mean? Is that 30? Is that 50? Is it a thousand? <laughs> what's a good, you know, what's a good reference there? I think it sort of depends on the size of the uh, property you have. Exactly. And what you're trying to cover and what you want to continue to have um, growing in lawn. So um, it's sort of up to you, I think. Would there be a minimum though? You wouldn't want to do less than. Yeah, I think it, what she said is a good point. It totally depends on the size of your property or, or the area you're dealing with. Um, I guess when I think of mass, even if it's maybe on a smaller scale, like the front yard or something, it's going to take up a good section of that area. That's in my mind. Um, so say it's your front yard, it's maybe half the yard or a third of the yard. It's, it's, it's a good, um, yeah, it's a very good substantial portion of that area. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and then sort of on that subject, we got a bunch of questions about um, how you how you sort of space things or, or can you plant um, if you're, you know, planting to sort of get you through the season. Can you plant spring bulbs and fall bulbs in the same area. How do you sort of negotiate that. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, you can and you can mix up and and plant <clears throat> for succession blooming. So there's there's always something. Um, I I think because that can get a little overwhelming thinking about um, you know all the different stages. I would first maybe look at the bulbs that you're most interested in um, that really speak to you, and then go back look at the times they bloom if you want to do that type of thing and go from there because if if you don't kind of narrow it down it's it's yeah it's really overwhelming mm -hmm. so definitely kind of picking the ones that speak to you most starting with that um and i feel like honestly that's something that usually happens kind of over time you know you start with maybe the the small scylla in your lawn and then you think wouldn't it be nice to have daffodils coming up through there? And then you throw in some of those. And then um, I think for me, it would be much easier to do um, kind of slowly getting into it than uh, just dive right in and try to complete the whole thing in one year or, or one season. Good advice. If you see my, if you see my yard, which is very much in transition, it looks really good in about for about three weeks and then I don't get it through the rest of the season. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, you had a participant who's asking about um, divide, wants to divide hostas and wants to plant some daffodils. And so how would she go about um, spacing daffodils in between the hostas? Like how much space would you recommend? I think it depends entirely on the size of the hosta because some are absolutely humongous and then some like the peewees are just tiny um so again judge the size of a hosta and then when they come up or where do you want to put the bulbs do you want them just to come up through the hosta or do you want them to surround the hosta mm. yeah i think the size of the hostas definitely makes a difference because some are like a say some in substance hosta is can be four feet tall and wide mm -hmm. um, and others can be quite quite demure um if you're doing that now so you know the, the plants are, are basically fully grown now if you could kind of wedge yourself in between them you're not going to hurt those hostas if you no. yeah if you go in and and you know get in the middle of them and um, you, you'll kind of be able to see where one ends and a new one begins and slide a group of maybe, you know, five bulbs in there and then move over a foot and get another few in there. Um, yeah, I would start by just doing that. Okay. Um, our, uh, one of our wonderful receptionists uh, is on this uh, virtual call and she is, she is uh, patiently waiting to, I think, redirect a question on chicken wire. Tish, do you want to Yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Oh, I, I need a little clarification and anybody can answer it. So when you said, um, so I'm going to put my bulbs down. I'm going to put chicken wire on top of them when I put them in. And then I'm going to let it stay there through the winter. And then in the spring, take the chicken wire off. I'm trying to understand when am I removing the chicken wire? You're not removing the chicken wire. <laughs> no. mm -hmm. The thought is, is that you're, you're planting the bulbs, probably putting down a little soil over them once you have them in the ground, placing that chicken wire on top, and then okay. throwing in the rest of the soil. So it's going to stay. Ah, I got yeah. you. I didn't mm -hmm. get that. And that's why I was saying, I didn't know how to ask. Long, write it out in the chat. Okay. okay. So they will that's, grow up through it. Well, wish me luck. This would be my first chance. And is the fence, um, if the sun comes all around it, that's a good spot? 
you know sure. how sure. that area it's about this wide and i was going to line them up coming down the whole fence yeah why not yeah true yeah thank you ladies you're welcome okay. all right great we've got a few more um so one participant is curious they have an area where they want to plant bulbs um, but want to treat for weeds and are curious about recommendations about um, product to use for tr to treat for the weeds but also timing in between treating and planting and and that sort of thing krista that's your question yeah yeah usually if you are and here I'm just making an assumption that you have both annual weeds, meaning some of these weeds are going to die um, this winter and not come back, but their seeds may sprout new in the, in the spring. And then some of them may be, because I feel like this is what we typically find, perennial weeds, which are coming back every single year. Um, yeah, if that's an area you want to get rid of all those and plant any product you use is going to tell you on the bottle um, how long you should give it before planting. Um, it, it's usually not that long. It doesn't require that long, long a time, maybe a few days. Um, and just, and it depends the route you want to go. Um, you can use, although it's a little cool now for um, horticultural vinegar, that will kill a lot of weeds. Um, it is not your average vinegar. It is a, it is horticultural vinegar. So the, the acid, I forgot exactly what kind it is. There's an acid in vinegar. It has a much higher degree in horticultural vinegar. Um, and we have used it um, in places and, and it works well, but it does like warmer temperatures. Um, so at this point, if I would say if you're not willing to hand weed this area, I would look at some type of, of brush killer. Um, yeah, or weed um, killer from the store. Okay. Um, okay, this is a this is I think probably somewhat of a common one. Um, someone is asking about mint taking over their how to prevent mint taking over the yard that's mixed in with their day lilies so mint obviously has a habit of doing that so any recommendations there well thank you okay. chop up the um, remove the day lilies then remove all the mint and then put the day lilies back that's a lot of work that's a lot of work that's true and you'll probably be pulling mint from there over the next few years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all you just, see is a little teeny piece left behind. <laughs> yeah, just stay, stay. Just stay at it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, a question about the um, autumn crocuses. Um, I think, uh, uh, so one participant planted some, they bloomed in fall, the leaves returned in spring and then um, never returned again. The area was basically undisturbed and kept fairly dry. Is this somewhat typical of autumn crocuses to have a short lifespan or is that unusual? I think so, but Krista, do you know? Yeah, I would think just one season is incredibly short. I mean, I, 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 don't get me wrong, there are bulbs that um, you may only get three to five years out of some perennials just work that way. It's not an unlimited lifespan, um, but that does seem very short to me. Um, okay. I wonder if it could have rotted. I mean, that can, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, a question about tulips. Um, Want, someone's wanting to plant something where tulips also grow. Should they dig up the bulb or try to plant on top of the tulips? Oh, plant on top or beside. Um, and not only that, um, then the, new, the other plants that you put in will hide the leaves from the tulips as they deteriorate. And you can do that with perennials. They're not fighting mm -hmm. too much for yeah. space. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. Yeah. Okay. Anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Are there a lot of additional questions? Because it's quarter after. There are three more questions. I think oh, we'll through them quickly. Okay. Um, should you cut the leaves of um, of iris, and when should that be done? 
I grew up down the street from an iris fancier. Her entire yard was iris. She had an iris tea every May. Um, and then she cut the, the leaves at a diagonal. And for the rest of the summer, her yard was really ugly. So I don't know. Um, I assume since so many people do that, it must be the thing to do. But Krista, do you have any? I was thinking about that as I was talking about them, actually. I, I'm because I see that a lot too, and I don't know if that's done just because maybe the tops will look a little ratty and that's just a person's way of kind of cleaning up. Mm -hmm. Or some people have problems with iris bores, which are yeah. little worms that get into the rhizome, eat it away. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if that maybe people think by doing that, you are, I just, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, to, to cut unless you don't like the look of it. If it looks too messy to you, maybe that's why people are cutting them. But, I don't know. Yeah. Or you could grow Siberian iris and then you don't have to do that. True. Okay, uh, a clarification on your, um, to plant three times uh, deep, the bulb mm -hmm. clarification. Um, the question was, what are you measuring? Are you measuring from top to bottom of the bulb? And right. then if it's two inches, you go six inches right. down. Got it. Yeah, so you're looking at your metal um, standing up. Yeah. Okay, one last question. I think this might be Sue Boyer's, and my handwriting at the point I got to this last question is not so good. So, Sue, <laughs> you're on here and you're um, not muted, please, please uh, interrupt me. Um, can you transplant winter aconite? Is that what I wrote? I don't know. Uh, again, and when should it be done? Does that make sense to you? Because I'm not sure what I wrote. Sue, are you on here? Yeah, it's fine. That's what I asked. Okay. Can you transplant winter aconite? Is that your house that I always drive by that has it? Because it's only one house here in Oak Park. I see it. Has. Right, right. It's and I Nick, Nick Dietz's house. <laughs> and we did take some, we were given some aconite from him. So we did move it to our yard, but I'm not too sure it did very well. <laughs> You'd like to move it to hopefully get it to do better. Is that it? Yeah, get it to grow in our yard because it's gorgeous. And it's kind of like almost a, a rhizome underneath. Right. Yeah, and I just don't know when the right time would be to do it. It would seem to me you must be able to transplant it. but Probably now if you know where it is because obviously you're not seeing the tops of it right now. Yeah, you can't find it now. It's pretty gone. Yeah. 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 So oh, well, we'll right see after. if we were successful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe trying right after it's bloomed in the spring, because that way you know exactly where it is. And then yeah, well, that's what we did. So we'll let you know what happens. Okay, good. Um, spring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. This was really yes. good. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm.